I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Since 1952, I have witnessed the transformation of the international landscape, the emergence of the Commonwealth, the growth of the European Union, the end of the Cold War, and now the dark threat of international terrorism. This has been matched by no less rapid developments at home, in the devolved shape of our nation, in the structure of society, in technology and communications, in our work and in the way we live. Change has become a constant. Managing it has become an expanding discipline. The way we embrace it defines our future. I think what has defined the Elizabethan era is it took us from the ravages of war to this extraordinary world in which we live in now. So it actually defines the era of the greatest change the world has ever known. And yet, she managed to stay the same. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow. And God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. It is with the greatest sorrow that we make the following announcement. It was announced from Sandringham at 10.45 today, February the 6th, 1952, that the king, who retired to rest last night in his usual health, passed peacefully away in his sleep earlier this morning. When Princess Elizabeth received the news of the death of her father, she went into shock, as you would. I mean, she was shocked by his death because she thought he was getting better. And it, it meant the end of her life as she knew it. It hath pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lord, King George VI of blessed memory, by whose decease the crown is solely and rightfully come to the high and mighty princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary. We, therefore, the lords spiritual and temporal of this realm, being here assisted with these of his late majesty's privy council, with representatives of other members of the Commonwealth, with other principal gentlemen of quality, with the Lord Mayor, aldermen and citizens of London, and at the Royal Exchange, the glad tidings are announced in the city that was so long an independent and powerful part of the realm. Hers by right of succession, the Princess Elizabeth has agreed to accept the crown and rule as queen. Long live the queen. The 1950s was a difficult time for Britain, as post-war austerity still dominated the nation's economy. The infrastructural, social and economical remnants of World War II were still evident across the country. It was as difficult a time as ever for the new Queen too, who simultaneously took on her new duty as monarch whilst still grieving for her late father. The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, broadcast live on the 2nd of June 1953, unequivocally pushed television into the mainstream. Well, the coronation of the Queen was a huge and very significant affair. It was a three-hour ceremony. It was, everybody recalls, the coldest June day that had ever happened. And it was pouring with rain. 
More than 20 million people watched the event on television, outnumbering radio audiences for the first time. The BBC knew the event would be popular, based on the reaction to the limited broadcast of King George VI's coronation procession, but couldn't foresee it would mark the coming of age of television. Following her coronation, Her Majesty's influence was quickly established as she embarked with Prince Philip on a seven-month world tour, making her the first reigning monarch to visit Australia and New Zealand. The Commonwealth was really important to the Queen because it was the old empire, really. The empire became the Commonwealth and it was her father instigated the Commonwealth instead of the Empire. And the Queen felt it was her duty, not business, duty, to pull that Commonwealth together and to really make it the Commonwealth of Nations, which it became. Standing at last on Australian soil, on this spot that is the birthplace of the nation, I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. The World Commonwealth Tour went on to remain the longest overseas tour throughout her 70 years on the throne. Whilst the Queen was on her world tour, Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected President of the USA. The new president was quick to legislate an end to racial segregation in public schools. For the next 15 years, the civil rights movement worked to abolish institutional racial segregation, discrimination and disenfranchisement throughout the United States. Things to be seen as the medicine or the antidote to a sick world. It marked the start of Queen Elizabeth's reign as one that was full of progressive politics, aiming to bring people together, undoubtedly spurred on by the horrors of World War II. Political handovers were also happening back in Britain. Churchill resigned in 1955, and Anthony Eden was invited by the Queen to form a government on her behalf. Two years later, in 1957, Harold Macmillan succeeded Eden to become the third Conservative Prime Minister in two years. This afternoon, the Queen did me the great honour to ask me to form a government. I have accepted this duty. Following the impressive popularity of her televised coronation, the Queen's 1957 Christmas message was broadcast live on TV. On the 25th anniversary of the monarch's Christmas message, the Queen was beamed into the living rooms of those lucky enough to own a television. Happy Christmas. 25 years ago, my grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages. Today is another landmark, because television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. My own family often gather round to watch television, as they are at this moment, and that is how I imagine you now. I very much hope that this new medium will make my Christmas message more personal and direct. The world witnessed extraordinary change during the first decade of the Queen's reign, with enormous strides forward in science, technology and civil rights. And by the end of the decade, she had firmly established herself as one of the most important and influential women in the world. As the Queen entered her second decade as head of state, global political changes would continue to take place. Technology developed further and new conflicts arose as countries began to conform to a new post-war world order. 
At the start of the decade, Harold Macmillan's 1960 Winds of Change speech, which asked the white ruling government of South Africa to acknowledge the beginnings of the end of the apartheid, set the tone for global efforts to quell institutional racism and create a fairer, more tolerant world. The following year, John F. Kennedy was elected president of the USA and he continued the process of trying to bring greater equality to his country and ending the racism which had blighted the nation for so long. And when Americans are sent to Vietnam or West Berlin, we do not ask for whites only. It ought to be possible, therefore, for American students of any color to attend any public institution they select without having to be backed up by troops. Two years after his election, in November 1963, Kennedy was killed by an assassin as his motorcade drove through Dallas. Her Majesty sent her own messages of condolences and she was said to have greatly enjoyed meeting the Kennedys during their visit to the United Kingdom. Back in Britain, 1963 saw the release of the Beatles' first album and they quickly established themselves as the frontrunners of the new era of non-conformist pop culture. Alongside the new era of music came a new breed of fashion designers, introducing items like the miniskirt and flares to an unsuspecting public. The Queen, not to be left behind, adopted her own sense of style, keeping that sense of conservative dignity, yet adopting a more modern look, which she took with her on her travels, championing the British fashion designers of the time. The summer of 1966 was a defining moment of national pride when England beat West Germany in the Football World Cup in front of a packed Wembley Stadium and an enormous TV audience. The Queen proudly presented Bobby Moore with the trophy as England were crowned champions of the world. 1969 saw Nixon elected to the White House and, in the same year, the USA won the space race and man finally walked on the moon. Queen Elizabeth played a small part, helping escort the astronauts on their journey. On board Apollo 11, the astronauts had taken a tiny disc that contained a recorded message from Queen Elizabeth, stating, On behalf of the British people, I salute the skills and courage which have brought man to the moon. On November the 14th, 1969, the three astronauts from the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins, visited Buckingham Palace at the invitation of the royal family. The airport. I mean, did somebody? Did, did they come up and start physically threatening you? Yeah, well, we got. Yeah, go on. You say. We got to the airport, and our road managers had a lot of trouble trying to get the equipment in because the escalators had been turned off and things. So we got there and we got turned, uh, put into the transit lounge, and then we got pushed around from one corner of the lounge to to another. You know. You treat like ordinary passenger. Ordinary yeah. passenger. You're saying. <laughs> Was an ordinary passenger? What? He doesn't get kicked, does he? <laughs> and so they started knocking. 
The 1970s began with the news that no music fans wanted to hear. Tired of touring and the commercial pressures of the music industry, the Beatles, Britain's most iconic pop group, finally decided to end their musical collaboration. Amidst the sadness of the Beatles' split, the Queen and Prince Philip set on another long visit to Australia and the Pacific Rim to celebrate 200 years since Cook's discovery of Australia. During the tour, the Queen left the safety of her entourage and went on her first ever walkabout, getting close up to the cheering crowds, shaking hands and chatting with eager royalists. The first walkabout embodied the Queen's determination to modernize the monarchy and bridge the gap between herself and the people she served. Undoubtedly, her walkabout proved enormously popular, helping reconnect the monarchy to the people and is still, to this day, one of the most important aspects of a royal visit. In 1974, Richard Nixon resigned as president following the long aftermath of the Watergate scandal. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. Each time I have done so to discuss with you some matter that I believe affected the national interest. In all the decisions I have made in my public life, I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. The Queen and Richard Nixon had first met in 1957 when he was vice president and had kept a strong relationship with him throughout the remaining years of his 17-year political career. Nixon was succeeded by Gerald Ford, the sixth president of the Queen's reign. Following the scandal, the new president invited Her Majesty to a state dinner at the White House. The invitation emphasized the continued relationship between the UK and the US. Hosted by Ford and his wife Betty, the Queen and the President danced together, much to the joy of the other attendees. The special relationship was cemented and the Queen had once again fulfilled her duty. In 1977, Britain and much of the world celebrated the Queen's Silver Jubilee in honour of Her Majesty's 25 years as reigning monarch. At this moment of my Silver Jubilee, I want to thank all those in Britain and the Commonwealth who, through their loyalty and friendship, have given me strength and encouragement during these last 25 years. My thanks go also to the many thousands who have sent me messages of congratulations on my Silver Jubilee, that and their good wishes for the future. My Lord Mayor, when I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. Although that vow was made in my salad days, when I was green in judgment, I do not regret nor attract one word of it. The Queen and Prince Philip took on goodwill visits throughout the year and embarking on a Commonwealth tour to Fiji, Tonga, New Zealand and Australia. Their tour was rounded off by visits to Papua New Guinea, the West Indies and finally Canada, where they were joined by Prince Charles. Two years after the Jubilee celebrations, Margaret Thatcher was elected Britain's first female Prime Minister, a polarising figure in British politics. 
Thatcher would go on to serve as Prime Minister for 11 years. Although there was reported tension between the Queen and her Prime Minister, the image of two women in the most powerful and influential offices in the land projected the ever more progressive society the Queen had helped oversee during her first 25 years. As I enter the door of number 10, and I'll strive unceasingly to try to fulfill the trust and confidence that the British people have placed in me. In 1979, Thatcher publicly revealed one of the Queen's art surveyors was a double agent. Art historian Anthony Blunt, who had worked for the royal family since 1945, was revealed to be a Soviet spy. Were any lives put at risk during the war when you were inside MI5 and also working for the Russians? But, uh, owing to me? Yes. I, mean, I think the answer to that is categorically no. What kind of work were you doing for the Russians then inside the MI5? Um, the information that I passed to them was almost exclusively about German intelligence services. Uh, and that was largely information which, again, as I said in, in my statement, a lot of people in MI5 thought ought to have been given officially. The Cold War, which had been simmering since 1947, had infiltrated Buckingham Palace. For his deception, the Queen removed Blunt's knighthood. When you made your confession, did the Queen know? Well, this is a question again, which I shall, I mean, I, I would rather not discuss because my information is, uh, so to speak, second, if not secondhand, it's rather vague. Um, and I can only say that as far as I was told at the time, and later, she was not. But I, I may be wrong about this. That was what I was told. Following the distressing end to the 1970s and the threat of Soviet infiltrators on all levels of society, the Queen would have been hoping for less trouble as she entered her third decade on the throne. Unfortunately, 1981 proved to be one of the most dangerous years of the Queen's reign. When the Queen came by, you know, in the corner, he just stepped backwards, you know, took about a half step backwards and uh, raised it up in his right hand and then, uh, you know, held it police marksman style and fired about four or five shots. Then what happened? Then there was, you know, like I said, about three of us that came in from his right and behind you know, and got him over the railing into the street itself. And then the constables came and took him. Had you noticed him earlier? I'd seen him before, you know, all morning long. He'd been there longer than I had. Was I, there anything unusual about him? Just that he was alone, you know, by himself and didn't speak to anybody. How, did you, how would you describe him? Tall and about 6'1 and slender, with short brown hair and, you know, with the Charles and Diana Button on the lapel of his coat. On the 29th of July, 1981, Prince Charles, the Queen's eldest son and heir apparent to the throne, married Lady Diana Spencer in a ceremony which captured the hearts and minds of the nation. The event was watched by an estimated global television audience of 750 million people and was billed as the wedding of the century. A year after the wedding, Queen Elizabeth enjoyed another personal family moment with the birth and christening of Prince William. Close bonds weren't just forming within the royal family. For the UK and USA, the 1980s were a time when relations grew stronger too, mainly thanks to the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan as President of the United States, whose political views and policies paralleled those of Margaret Thatcher. With the politically aligned US President and UK Prime Minister in regular communication, a state visit was organized for Reagan. During his visit, he broke tradition and became the first US President to stay overnight at Windsor Castle. In the same decade, diplomatic efforts brought about the end of the Cold War, when President Ronald Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev 
signed a peace treaty. It was a time of great change in the world, but one in which Her Majesty played a significant role. The imagery of Gorbachev lunching with the Queen at Windsor Castle in 1989 was evidence of a new era of peace brewing. Following the historic trip of the Soviet leader, his relationship with Thatcher thawed. And for the first time since World War II, diplomacy was helping to cool down the seemingly never-ending tension between the world's great nuclear powers. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. On the 9th of November, 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. The physical symbol of the division between the West and the Soviet Union was destroyed. The reconnection of East and West Germany alluded to the beginning of the end of the decades-long Cold War. Whilst the world rejoiced at the end of global tensions associated with the Cold War, the 90s would prove to be Her Majesty's most challenging decade. It saw a shift in British politics when Thatcher resigned after 11 years and handed the reins to John Major. No longer were the two highest offices in the land occupied by women. For the Queen, John Major would become the 10th Prime Minister of her reign. I'd like, uh, I'd like firstly, if I may, to thank my many parliamentary colleagues for the tremendous support they've given me today. It's an enormous encouragement to know that so many people in the parliamentary party are prepared to entrust me with the leadership of the Conservative Party. The two years following the resignation of Thatcher were the Queen's notably difficult, which she dubbed her Annus Horribilis. The year saw the separation of Prince Charles and Diana, the divorce of Princess Anne and Mark Phillips, and the Windsor Castle fire. The foundations of the royal family, both metaphorically and literally, were burning away. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. <clears throat> In the words, of one of my more sympathetic correspondents, it has turned out to be an annus horribilis. I sometimes wonder how future generations will judge the events of this tumultuous year. I dare say that history will take a slightly more moderate view than that of some contemporary commentators. He who has never failed to reach perfection has a right to be the harshest critic. In 1993, Bill Clinton was inaugurated as the 42nd president of the USA. Clinton wrote about the Queen in his memoir, saying, Her Majesty impressed me as someone who, but for the circumstance of her birth, might have become a successful politician or diplomat. As it was, she had to be both, without quite seeming to be either. In 1994, the Queen made a historic state trip to Russia. Alongside Prince Philip, the Queen stayed at the Kremlin for three days. It was the first ever state visit to Russia by a British monarch, and was undoubtedly a symbolic and significant moment, encapsulating the post-war era. In 1995, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip were invited to Cape Town by the new South African president, Nelson Mandela. My memories of South Africa are part of me, and I have wanted to return to this magnificent country. That wish has never deserted me 
through a half century during which you have seen turmoil and tragedy. Now though, you have become one nation whose spirit of reconciliation is a shining example to the world. Against security advice, she and her husband visited black townships where they were greeted with tears of joy by black and white supporters alike. President Mandela was invited to Buckingham Palace in 1996 and he spoke in adoration for this gracious lady. As we approach the 21st century, our relationship is one of friendship, fortified on South Africa's side by a warmth and respect for yourself, for Britain and for the Commonwealth. You have yourself provided the leadership and by your willingness to embrace your former captors, have set the course towards national reconciliation and freedom for all the people of South Africa. The face of British politics saw a drastic change in 1997, as Tony Blair became Prime Minister, ending 18 years of Conservative rule. Thank you. Well, A new dawn has broken, has it not? And it is wonderful. We always said that if we had the courage to change, then we could do it, and we did it. Three months after the election of Tony Blair, the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, pushed the royal family into one of their most difficult periods. Diana was one of the most popular figures across the world, and her death touched millions. But whilst the people lost their princess, the Queen's grandchildren, Prince William and Harry, had lost their beloved mother. Some expressed anger towards the royal family following the loss of Diana, not only for their perceived mistreatment of the late princess during her time as a royal, but more importantly, due to their silence after her death. Spurred on by the diminishing popularity of her institution and the need to do something to put things right, the Queen addressed the nation on live TV. What I say to you now as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others and especially for her devotion to her two boys. I, for one, believe there are lessons to be drawn from her life and from the extraordinary and moving reaction to her death. I share in your determination to cherish her memory. I hope that tomorrow we can all, wherever we are, join in expressing our grief at Diana's loss and gratitude for her all too short life. It is a chance to show to the whole world the British nation united in grief and respect. You get ready? Must. Yes, must. Let's read these words the fast way without making a mistake. Get ready? Kite. Yes, kite. Get ready? Kick. Yes, kick. Get ready? Must. Yes, must. Boys and girls, pick your reader up and send 60 on page 153. Mm -hmm. In January 2001, George W. Bush became President of the United States. His agenda and priorities were quickly altered following the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center on the 11th of September 2001. The attacks resulted in the deaths of 2,977 people, and it remains the worst single terror attack in human history.
Relations between the UK and the USA would only get stronger in the face of global terrorism after joining forces and declaring war on Iraq. The Queen exemplified these relations when she sent a message to the USA where many were faced with heartbreaking and personal losses, read by the British ambassador during a prayer service. These are dark and harrowing times for families and friends of those who are missing or who suffered in the attack, many of you here today. My thoughts and my prayers are with you all now and in the difficult days ahead. But nothing that can be said can begin to take away the anguish and the pain of these moments. Grief is the price we pay for love. The public sentiment of her message became much more personal to the Queen in 2002, following the deaths of the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret. Within a few months, Her Majesty had lost two of the most important people in her life. The Queen gave a televised address to the nation, thanking the public for the outpouring of love and prayers. Ever since my beloved mother died over a week ago, I have been deeply moved by the outpouring of affection which has accompanied her death. My family and I always knew what she meant for the people of this country and the special place she occupied in the hearts of so many here, in the Commonwealth, and in other parts of the world. But the extent of the tribute that huge numbers of you have paid my mother in the last few days has been overwhelming. I have drawn great comfort from so many individual acts of kindness and respect. Although 2002 was a year of great personal loss, it was also the Queen's Golden Jubilee year. Even whilst grieving for the two most important people in her life, the Queen's stoicism and duty were unmatched as she travelled to 70 cities and towns across the UK from May to August to be a part of the celebrations dedicated to her. In 2005, London faced its own terrorist tragedy with four separate suicide attacks on London's public transport. The way the emergency services were responding soon told Londoners that this was no ordinary accident. Soon after half past nine, the second explosion, this time at West London's Edgware Road. The bomb was on one tube train, two others were caught up in its blast. In their first attack, the bombers had killed seven. At Edgware Road, they took another five quite innocent lives and injured scores more. The Queen has just issued her reaction to uh, today's events in London. It says, uh, the dreadful events in London this morning have deeply shocked us all. I know I speak for the whole nation in expressing my sympathy to all those affected and the relatives of the killed and injured. I have nothing but admiration, she goes on, for the emergency services as they go about their work. In the same year, Charles married Camilla Parker Bowles at Windsor Guildhall. Buckingham Palace announced the Queen would not attend the ceremony, but would attend the church blessing and host a reception. In 2007, after a significant reduction in Labour's majority, low approval ratings, and the continuing impact of the Iraq war, Tony Blair resigned, leaving Gordon Brown to become Prime Minister. I have just accepted the invitation of Her Majesty the Queen to form a government. Whilst politically the country was in somewhat turmoil, 2007 was, for the Queen at least, a more pleasant year, as she and Prince Philip celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. In 2009, Barack Obama took over the White House when he was elected president, becoming the first African-American to hold the highest office in the USA. 
The Queen and Prince Philip met with President Obama and the First Lady Michelle Obama at Buckingham Palace, forging what would become a strong relationship. The marriage of Prince William and Kate Middleton in 2011 was one of the most anticipated events in the modern era. Britain was bustling with excitement for the marriage of the future king to his university sweetheart. For Her Majesty, seeing her grandson marry would have been one of her proudest moments. With the marriage of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their desire to have their own family, the Queen amended the Bill of Rights Act of Settlement to Succession to the Crown Act. The changes saw the end of the system of male primogeniture, meaning whether the Cambridges had a boy or a girl, their first child would take their place as third in line to the throne. 2012 saw the Queen celebrate her Diamond Jubilee, a rare occasion for a monarch, marking 60 years since her accession to the throne. Celebrations were widespread including the Thames Diamond Jubilee pageant and the concert at Buckingham Palace. Your Majesty, Mummy, <laughs> as a nation, this is our opportunity to thank you and my father for always being there for us, for inspiring us with your selfless duty and service and for making us proud to be British. Two thousand and twelve was also a time for much excitement in London, as the city hosted the Olympic Games for the first time in sixty four years. This will be the third Olympiad, third London Olympiad. My great grandfather opened the nineteen hundred and eight Games at White City. My father opened the nineteen forty eight Games at Wembley Stadium. And later this evening, I will take pleasure in declaring open the 2012 London Olympic Games at Stratford in the east of London. Not one to miss out on the fun, the Queen showed the well-known humorous side of her character when she literally launched herself into the Games opening ceremony. Good evening, Your Majesty. Two thousand and fifteen saw the Queen hit another record-breaking landmark when she surpassed her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, to become the UK's longest-serving monarch. Many, including you, First Minister, have also kindly noted another significance attaching to today. Although it is not one to which I have ever aspired, inevitably, a long life can pass by many milestones. My own is no exception. But I thank you all, and the many others at home and overseas, for your touching messages of great kindness. Whilst the first half of the decade was dedicated to celebrating the longevity of the Queen and her successors, the second half of the decade was dedicated to political changes that would alter the course of history. After years of royal landmarks and the celebrations that followed, political changes were beginning to emerge that would change the course of history across the world. In 2016, a momentous referendum was held and the people of the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union, resulting in David Cameron resigning as Prime Minister and being succeeded by Theresa May. In David Cameron, I follow in the footsteps of a great modern Prime Minister. Under David's leadership, the government stabilised the economy, reduced the budget deficit, 
and helped more people into work than ever before. But David's true legacy is not about the economy, but about social justice. 2017 saw Donald Trump inaugurated as president of the USA amid widespread protests. The UK found itself divided on Brexit, with negotiations for the exit proving to be challenging. With the exciting anticipation of another royal wedding, the decade ended how it had begun. This time, it was Prince Harry's turn as he tied the knot with Meghan Markle. In some ways, their marriage demonstrated the progress and modernization of the monarchy, characteristics the Queen was proud of. The uniquely difficult start to the 2020s was fueled by a global pandemic sweeping across the world. In times of crisis and tragedy, the Queen has always come through to offer the nation a sense of hope. Her broadcast to the nation following the outbreak of coronavirus referenced the wartime spirit that would be needed to get through the difficult times, but offered certainty that we would get through it. I hope in the years to come, everyone will be able to take pride in how they responded to this challenge. And those who come after us will say the Britons of this generation were as strong as any. But the attributes of self-discipline, of quiet, good-humoured resolve, and of fellow feeling still characterise this country. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again we will meet again. But for now, I send my thanks and warmest good wishes to you all. In April 2021, following a short illness, Prince Philip, the Queen's husband, died peacefully, surrounded by his family. I'm sure that losing Philip was absolutely dreadful for her. It must have been very hard for the Queen being alone at Prince Philip's funeral because she might have just wanted to hold somebody's hand. But in a way, she just put her hand in the hand of God because that's what she was like. Much like Her Majesty, Philip had given his life to duty too and was always at her side as her greatest supporter. The following year, on the 6th of February 2022, the Queen became the first British monarch to celebrate a Platinum Jubilee, marking 70 years of service to the people of the United Kingdom, the realms and the Commonwealth. Across the world, events were held and people came together to celebrate the Queen's long reign. On Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland, a flaming arrow was fired as part of a chain of beacon lighting, celebrating 70 years of the Queen's reign. The celebration concluded with a concert at Buckingham Palace, although the Queen didn't attend due to ill health. Seven months after celebrating her Platinum Jubilee, the Queen passed away. When it was finally announced that the Queen had died, there was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because 
You know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course, it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. Nothing quite outlines her legacy more than the outpouring of emotion in the days and weeks that followed her death. As the world reflected on the life she lived, the events she saw, and the history she made. At 21 years old, the young Princess Elizabeth, who would become our Queen, dedicated her life to the service of her people and the Commonwealth. For the next 75 years, Her Majesty conducted herself with grace, dignity, and determination to fulfill her duty. Over her 70-year reign, her life was put on hold, bound by the promise she made, solely committed to the people she served. The Queen didn't just live through history, she was history. Her longevity on the throne made her the cornerstone of our modern world, a common thread weaved through an ever-changing society that held us all together. In her death, we remember the accidental queen who became the world's most popular monarch. Her legacy remains forever as the extraordinary woman who helped steer Britain and the world through the ups and downs of the last century. You, you will, to um, cut the first slice. I did remark that it was upside down and you wouldn't be able to see what was on it. I told it had to be upside down for the press. And they can see. <laughs> I don't know. I don't Does matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you can probably read it upside down. I too. think you probably can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do this. Yes. Thank you.